From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. The Supreme Court wading back into the fight over abortion. Justice Samuel Alito issuing an order today to keep a widely used abortion pill available for five more days as the court makes up its mind over what to do next. We'll speak with an expert on reproductive rights about what to expect coming up. Plus, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy preparing for a major speech over the debt ceiling after months of stagnation. McCarthy is taking his case to Wall Street with an address at the New York Stock Exchange on Monday. And more fallout from the leak of classified documents and the arrest of a 21-year-old National Guardsman, Jack Teixeira. We'll talk national security implications with Democratic Congressman Jake Auchincloss of Massachusetts. It's another day with breaking news, Anne-Marie. We, we just hour by hour seem to be changing our plan on this program, but that is the whole point of Balance of Power being here at 5 o'clock Washington time. And we start with our top story. Breaking a short time ago, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito putting a five-day hold on a new court imposed restriction on the abortion pill Mifepristone that we've been talking about for days now. Joining us by phone, Bloomberg Supreme Court reporter Greg Storr. Greg, thanks for some time today. I know it's a busy one for you. This gives the court more time to think. What happens in five days? Well, if nothing, in five days, this administrative stay uh, dissolves, and if the court doesn't do anything else, it would mean that those restrictions go into place. But the strong suggestion here is that we will hear something else from the Supreme Court at that point. They will either say we're going to stay the lower court ruling and we're going to preserve full access to Mifepristone, or they will say we won't stay it, in which case those restrictions are going to go into place, and they are pretty significant restrictions. Hmm. The administrative stays are designed to preserve the status quo. They're not designed, though, to give us any views on the merits of this case. Any tea leaves you're reading out of the Supreme Court on what we can expect in five days? Not out of this order. Um, uh, you know, this is really kind of a form order, except for the fact that they stuck some, some deadlines in there. Um, and, and that's by design. Uh, you know, this is, is something that is really just designed to buy the court some time, as you suggested. You know, th this case has happened, moved along really, really quickly. We got this 42-page order from a federal appeals court late Wednesday night, and it's pretty complicated. And what exactly the effect of that order would be uh, is, is, is disputed. And so it's kind of a natural move for the Supreme Court to say, hey, we need a little more time to understand exactly what's going on here, give everybody a chance to, to weigh in before we make a decision. All right, Greg Storr, thank you so much. We're looking forward to your reporting over the course of the next few days. That's our Supreme Court justice reporter, Greg Storr. And joining us now around the table are Bloomberg's Megan Scully. Uh, she's a team leader for Congress and White House correspondent Jordan Fabian. Jordan, I want to start with you because what we're hearing out of the Supreme Court today is in response to the Biden administration asking the Supreme Court to get involved. That's right. Uh, the, you know, the Biden administration has really tried to push to preserve abortion access in the wake of the Dobbs decision last year, and so they joined this legal effort. But they're also keeping an eye on the political situation, too. They know that restrictions on abortion were a political loser for Republicans in 2022, and should the Supreme Court abandon uh, those restrictions and, and really let uh, Mifeprestone uh, you know, be banned by the courts, I, I think the, a lot of people in the White House and the Democratic Party could see that as a, another boost uh, mm -hmm. for their voters, really uh, you know, encouraging them to get out to the polls in 2024 mm -hmm. and not only vote for Joe Biden, but also Democratic con congressional candidates. That's, the, that's where I wanted to go with you here, Megan. We know how this polls. Even more than 70 mm percent -hmm. of Americans oppose uh, some of the restrictions that we're talking about here. You don't see numbers like that for most issues. Does this go down ballot? Is this not only a presidential campaign issue, but one that will follow members of Congress through the next year and change? Absolutely. I think we saw that in 2022, um, which, you know, was just a few months after the Dobbs decision. Um, and I think what's more here, too, is this is probably the last issue the Supreme Court wants to be dealing with right now. They saw their numbers, their approval ratings tank, um, and clearly they're not up for re-election, but trust in the Supreme Court is 
is is important to to the justices and, and to the country at large. So the they saw the numbers tank after the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade, and then they've sort of gotten a little bit better over the last few months. Last week, we saw what happened with Clarence Thomas and the luxury vacations he took on a <laughs> yeah. billionaire's dime, and now we see abortion appearing at, again before the court. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a lot of, lot of issues the Supreme Court at this one juncture is facing. Jordan, you mentioned the politics of this all. I want to bring you a little bit of what Vice President Harris on Thursday said in response to the abortion pill ruling in Texas. Take a listen. We are having an experience where the women of America in particular um, have been um, in a state of fear about what this means for them, what this means for the people they love. The ramifications of this decision five days ago are wide sweeping and for that reason require, we do believe, a very serious um, response. Vice President. Kamala Harris there, she's really taken this issue to be the leader in the White House, to go out and speak about it. Her poll numbers, though, kind of lackluster. If this is going to be a huge 2024 issue, can this actually help her star rise in the Democratic Party? I think it could. She handled it pretty ably in 2022, becoming really the spokesperson for this White House on abortion. Uh, President Joe Biden is uh, a deeply Catholic. He is uncomfortable talking about this issue. And Kamala Harris, on the other hand, was struggling to find a lane for herself, a, a real uh, issue to champion, and she did find one with abortion rights. So, as you mentioned, Amory, this is yet another opportunity for her to show her chops on this, be a leader and a vocal presence inside the White House on an issue that a lot of Democratic voters and a lot of Americans care about. As we head into this weekend, guys, we're preparing for a big day on Monday, and it's not going to be here in Washington. It's going to be in New York. Not only do we have the field hearing that we talked about, Anne Marie, on violent crime in the city, Jim Jordan will be in lower Manhattan. So, too, will be mm -hmm. the Speaker of the House, uh, Megan. Kevin McCarthy is going to the New York Stock Exchange. Yes. To what? Soothe investors or scare them? <laughs> well, he did tell Anne Marie, what was it, just last week, that they should be they worried. They should be worried. Yeah. I said, what's your best? Should Wall Street be worried? He said, yes, Wall Street should, should be, be worried. Should be a fun day on the markets, huh? Yes. So he is having yet another Reagan esque moment. Um, he spoke at the Reagan Library last week, and now um, he's going to the, the stock exchange to speak, much like. Reagan, whose portrait hangs over his desk and, and he says is the reason why he's a Republican, um, spoke uh, at, the, at the stock market all those years ago. Um, he's going to be talking about the debt limit, which is on the minds of many who will be standing there on the floor and, um, and clearly us in Washington as well. Yeah. So does he want a market reaction? Because <laughs> the fact that question. Wall Street isn't worried, you'd think a politician would say, well, this is good. I'm not getting all these phone calls. Keep but, it he, that way. but yeah, he said to me, <laughs> they should be worried. There's no market reaction. And now he's going to the New York Stock Exchange to say, you should be concerned. So his, his, his offer right now, or, or that we're hearing essentially, is to push this off for another year um, till May 2024, the, the debt limit, you know, hitting that. And then there would be extraordinary measures beyond then that could actually get us past the past the election. Um, I think what he's trying to do really is throw this in the president's court. He has said all along, Joe Biden needs to sit down and talk to me. We haven't met since February. Um, and and it, this is just another attempt um, with the stock market, you know, at yeah. his feet to to make that call once again. So, Jordan, what's the potential for a backfire here? You know, you want to use Wall Street to make a point. Wall Street may not play along. Let's say the market dumps on whatever he says <laughs> on Monday. The White House is a pretty easy response on that, right? Absolutely. It gives the White House more leverage, and it paints Kevin McCarthy as the chaos agent uh, if the markets react negatively to his comments. Mm -hmm. The White House's stance all along is that Congressional Republicans need to come up with a budget in order to get a meeting with President Biden. And the internal view in, among the staff is that Republicans uh, in the House don't have a majority around a proposal on the debt limit, despite what uh, Kevin McCarthy is going to offer on Monday. And so their stance is, look, we can't negotiate with Plato. I mean, it's, it's, it's just falling apart in your hands. But, but Jordan, yeah. end of the day. If the Republicans do not get a budget in time, there is no meeting with Biden. Say, say the U.S. did default. Biden is the president of the United States. He owns that. Do they have a plan B? Yeah. No, you point out a very, a very big Most problem, normal, which is that— Everyday Americans are not going to blame the Speaker of the House, are they? Well, I think the, the blame will be spread around to, to both— <laughs> 
Kevin McCarthy and Joe enough. Biden. If you go back to 2011, though, it wasn't about an individual. It was about a party, right? Yeah. It was yeah. the majority at the time, and Kevin McCarthy could share some of that. Exactly. And you go back to other crises like the government shutdowns in the 90s, which really backfired on Republicans. So right now, the White House is making the gamble, you know, with a few months to play around, that this is not going to come back on them. If we do get closer to an X date and there's no solution and Biden is refusing to negotiate and Republicans do manage to conjure up some kind of proposal, then I think the tables turn and President Joe Biden is put on his back foot. And he's going to have to have a, have a sit down with yes. McCarthy. He told me mm, he's waiting mm. for a sit down. Right now they just communicate through these letters mm. yes. that we in the press all also get to read. It's nowhere so <laughs> yeah, far. Yeah, exactly. But Wall Street's not worried yet. Let's see about Monday. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Megan Scully and White House correspondent Jordan Fabian for our discussion around the table this Friday. Coming up, we're going to look into the 21-year-old alleged leaker of Pentagon documents. He's appearing in court today and will be joined by Democratic Representative Jake Auchincloss of Massachusetts. That's next right here on Balance of Power. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Thanks for joining us. The 21-year-old National Guardsman arrested in the Pentagon documents case appearing in federal court today in Boston for allegedly accessing and leaking highly classified national defense information. The Guardsman, Jack Teixeira, who refused bail, could face up to 15 years in prison if convicted. Joining us to discuss, Massachusetts Congressman Jake Auchincloss. Congressman, thanks for being with us. I can't imagine your thoughts on this happening essentially in your own backyard and I wonder if you think the charges fit the crime. It's embarrassing for the United States as a nation and distracting for the country and our allies as we pursue critical aims like the spring counteroffensive for the Ukrainians. This individual and any of his accomplices who helped leak these documents should, if found guilty, be uh, punished for betraying the confidence of the United States, for undermining the U.S. national interest, and most grievously, for putting their compatriots overseas in harm's way. It sounds like, Representative, that you think this is a serious issue. Why did the Biden administration and the president himself try to downplay this leak? We're still learning about so much of what's in those documents also today. It's a serious crime and it should be prosecuted fully. Uh, I have not yet seen any indications that the documents that have been leaked are going to long-term strategically undermine U.S. national interests, whether in regards to our allies or to our uh, sources and methods. Now, more may come out, but I do think that our partnership with countries like South Korea, which is based on, on deep shared values and strongly aligned priorities, uh, is going to be... Uh, is going to be able to withstand the dings and dents from this embarrassing week. You mentioned Ukraine, Congressman. You and I have talked quite a bit about the war effort and what might come this spring. How concerned are you about what we saw in these documents about Ukraine's readiness and what Russia may have learned from all of this? I'm concerned. It's the one that concerns me the most. And we should use it as a country and as a national security establishment in Washington as a clarion call to redouble our support for the Ukrainians fighting on the front lines of the free world. This spring counteroffensive is momentous. It's important not just militarily for their ability to punch through the lines in the South and or the East, but also politically mm -hmm. in creating the conditions necessary uh, for a negotiated long-term peace that secures Ukrainian borders and provides it a pathway to the Black Sea or the Sea of Azov that gives it industrial viability in the long run. We need this counteroffensive to be successful, and we should leave no stone unturned. We should leave no arm unshipped in making the Ukrainians uh, the most potent fighting force they can be. So, so is your thinking now that because of these documents, Ukraine is now put in a more vulnerable place when it comes to this fresh potential offensive we're going to see from Russia? I haven't seen clear and convincing evidence of that yet, but uh, I, do, I do certainly see it as a possibility. Regardless, though, this incident uh, should serve as a, 
as a catalyst for increased U.S. commitment to the cause of Ukraine and to redouble our efforts in support of their counteroffensive. It also needs to be a jumping off point for some very tough and pointed questions for the Pentagon on Capitol Hill. Pentagon officials are going to have to explain why a junior enlisted Air National Guardsman has access to Ukrainian war plans being briefed to the Joint Staff. Congressman, you, of course, led an infantry unit in combat in Afghanistan as a Marine. And I wonder your thoughts as a veteran about what we have learned over the past couple of days uh, from the White House, from the Biden administration, about its withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I'm going to start by bringing you back two years. President Biden announced a withdrawal. Let's listen. After consulting closely with our allies and partners, with our military leaders and intelligence personnel, with our diplomats and our development experts, with the Congress and the Vice President, as well as with Mr. Ghani and many others around the world, I've concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. That was on April 14th, 2021, this day. Fast forward to roughly one week ago at the White House, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby recapping the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan following that internal review. Here he is. That airport was basically, for all intents and purposes, American property, surrounded by the Taliban and ISIS-K. So they not only had to run an airport, get the radars up and going, do air traffic control, get planes coming in and getting them loaded, have medical screening, have security vetting, have diplomatic presence on the ground to make sure that we're putting the right people on planes, uh, but also defend that airport from external threats. Um, that's pretty remarkable. And so for all this talk of chaos, I just didn't see it, not from my perch. Congressman, I know you supported the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the war that you fought in. We also lost, of course, over a dozen service members in the process. Is the administration taking the right posture on this by essentially blaming the prior administration? The Biden administration is recounting for the American public uh, the decisions that it faced when it took office. Donald Trump had negotiated a deal in secret in Doha with the Taliban that basically said America is going to leave and the Taliban has to pinky promise that they're not going to do anything wrong in the meantime. It was one of the worst deals ever negotiated in the history of American foreign policy. Joe Biden took office. Wow. He had a decision to make. One, he could leave Afghanistan, end 20 years worth of a uh, failed forever war. Or two, he could significantly ramp up American troop presence and fight another decade uh, against the Taliban. There was no middle way. Let me be very clear about this. There was no option to keep 2,500 troops there safely. That would have put them in the immediate, imminent harm's way. Joe Biden made the morally courageous decision to tell the American people that this war could not be won with force of arms. It had a political solution, not a military solution, and that the responsible thing to do was to withdraw American troops so that we could focus on the Indo-Pacific and the true 21st century threat of the Chinese Communist Party. But does this report shift too much of the blame in terms of the days of those withdrawal? You had individuals falling off planes of U.S. military aircraft. And then you have the White House coming out and saying that they did not see chaos. There is no flawless way to exit a nation with 20 years' worth of materiel and logistics. And certainly not when the president of the country you are tasked with defending flees instead of leading his troops, uh, as we see someone like Volodymyr Zelensky do in Ukraine. What the Biden administration had to do was make a hard decision as commander in chief, which is to say, is this a war that is in America's best interest? And is this a war that we can win? And the answer, after 20 years of dissembling from the American national security establishment, was no. We had accomplished the counterterrorism mission. The nation-building mission could not be done with force of arms. And it was time to turn our bandwidth and our resources to true geostrategic priorities. Congressman, thank you so much for that insight, especially since uh, you fought there and given up a lot of your time and uh, security for the United States. That's Jake Auchincloss, congressman from Massachusetts. Coming up the program, the IRS got an injection of $80 billion to increase audits, especially on the wealthy. But will it bring in much needed revenue? That conversation coming up next. This is Balance of Power.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. The IRS is getting $80 billion, you probably heard it by now, to boost its auditing game. But a new report in Bloomberg Business Week says they, that may not be enough, nearly enough. For more, we welcome Bloomberg Wealth reporter Ben Steverman. It's great to have you with us on the program, Ben. Welcome. We heard a lot about this in Washington. I thought there, were, there was an army of IRS agents about to come knock down my door uh, with guns to audit me this year. Based on my tax return, I won't even get into that. But uh, as far as this is concerned, your reporting would suggest, and talking with a lot of veterans of the agency, they need a lot more than that. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a IRS that has been really shrunken down to a shadow of its former self. We've had basically a thirty eight percent slide in staff over the last few decades, um, and the people who've left the IRS because of these budget cuts are the most experienced auditors, the, the people that knew how to manage these technology systems that are are now ancient, running on computer language language from the sixties. So what? According to my reporting and talking to a couple dozen former employees to try to get some insight into this organization, my, uh, my takeaway was what this organization needs is a major culture shift. And um, that is something that the Biden administration is promising along with the $80 billion that they've secured uh, in new funding. But we'll see if that's actually accomplishable uh, given this is a huge bureaucracy and the, these problems are really deep seated. I thought they needed money to become more technical and to have this work properly. What do you mean by a culture shift? Well, I mean, this is a th this is an organization that's been just attacked um, politically <laughs> for decades, and people are um, there's a silo mentality there. Like th there's there's really sort of a bunker mentality where departments don't talk to each other. So, okay, you can invest in technology, but you need those technology people to talk to the auditors to figure out how to design the tools that the auditors can use to find uh, <laughs> cheating out there. And maybe maybe it actually that actually reduces audit rates because you go after the people that really are doing something wrong rather than wasting people taxpayers' time on audits that don't actually yield extra, extra, extra revenue. There's a lot of sophisticated ben. things you can do. Ben, thank you so much for that. We look forward to sharing your story more on Bloomberg Business Week this weekend. Bloomberg's Ben Stiverman. Coming up, a look at the possible economic implications of abortion restrictions. That's next. This is Balance of Power. Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Thanks for joining us. With the fate of abortion pill access still hanging in the legal balance after the Supreme Court placed a temporary hold on new restrictions today and a new ban on abortion after six weeks of pregnancy signed into law by Governor DeSantis in Florida, we take a closer look now on the economics of abortion policies, an important story that Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons brings to us. Hey, Kaylee, we finally are putting some data on this. Yeah, and I think the data to establish first, most importantly, is the demographics of women who typically seek abortions. If you look at research from the Guttmacher Institute, which is a research policy organization focused specifically on reproductive health, 49% of abortion patients live below the poverty line. 75% are considered poor or low income. The majority already have children, are women of color, and are in their 20s. And there can be serious economic consequences for women who don't have the ability to seek an abortion. This is something we heard from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen last summer before the Dobbs decision. She gave a warning to Congress. Take a listen to that. Well, I believe that eliminating the right of women to make decisions about when and whether to have children would have very damaging effects um, on the economy and would set women back decades. So on those damaging effects, the Institute for Women's Policy Research, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, said this back in 2021, so again, pre-Dobbs, 
that their research estimates state-level abortion restrictions cost state economies $105 billion per year by reducing labor force participation and earnings levels, increasing turnover and time off from work among women ages 15 to 44 years, which is how they define women of reproductive age. And they actually break it down state by state. So I looked at Florida, given it is in the news right now. Their estimates from 2020 say the total economic loss for women in that age group due to restrictions in the state was $6.5 billion. Had those restrictive policies been eliminated, GDP in the state would have been six-tenths of a percent higher, and the increase in labor force participation for those women would have been 1.25 percent should those policies have been eliminated. Obviously, all this data shows how much of an economic story this is, not just a health care story. But you mentioned Florida. This has become a haven for women in the South that come from very restrictive cases. Yep. Following Roe v. Wade, women were, that was their place they went to, to seek safe abortions. Yeah, and obviously the story in Florida is very much changing, which speaks to what we're seeing more widely in the country, where women then have to seek care out of state. And when we're talking about the demographics of the states in which uh, restrictive policies are already in place, data from the Economic Policy Institute, another nonpartisan think tank, shows they're likely to have a lower minimum wage, a lower share of unemployed people on unemployment benefits, and that these are generally people that already are economically disempowered, according to the thesis of this research and abortion then amplifies it. So it's having so to pay the cost to travel so to harder. another state and seek that care, going back to the Gottmacher Institute, they say respondents in restricted states in a survey that they just published this month are more likely to be paying out of pocket, relying on financial assistance, and indicate it was difficult to pay for the abortion. Yeah. And this is why this is becoming such a huge issue for corporations, mm -hmm. because employees are going to them and saying, right. if I am going to have to travel, I am going to need this covered as part of my health care package, because it's I'm really not getting it from the government. It's really important that Kaylee presents that, too. It's not only a personal uh, economic story, personal finance story, but this is coming out of state coffers as well, yeah. and the broader job market with labor force participation. You, you can't underscore enough the economic impact yeah. on all sides of this. Absolutely. Kaylee, thank you so much for that story. Kaylee Lines with us on the economics surrounding this top story out of Washington today, the fight over abortion, and it's ramping up with the Biden administration asking the U.S. Supreme Court to pause court-ordered restrictions on a widely used abortion pill. For more now, we're joined now by Mary Ziegler, legal historian and professor of law at UC Davis. She's also the author of several books on abortion law, including most recently, Roe, The History of a National Obsession. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, for spending some time. I know you are incredibly busy. What is your reaction <laughs> to what we've heard today out of the Supreme Court, this administration five-day, basically status quo hold? What do you think this leads to in the next five days? I mean, we don't really know anything based on the Supreme Court issuing this administrative stay. Essentially, the Supreme Court is just acknowledging that this is a complicated case and there's no way they can really dig into the law and facts it before the Fifth Circuit's order would otherwise have gone into effect. So we can't really guess anything based on the fact they issued this stay. Otherwise, it's hard to guess, too, because on the one hand, you have a very conservative court that's been hostile to abortion rights and also hostile to administrative agencies like FDA. On the other hand, there's some real problems with this specific case, starting with the fact that the plaintiffs might not have standing to sue, that the case might not be timely, that the case is based on scientific claims that the FDA vetted and rejected, you know, 20 plus years ago. So I think the interesting question is whether this is a Supreme Court that will say no to any request to make it harder to get access to abortion, or whether there are still some limits and whether cases like this one um, are imperfect enough vehicles that the court turns them away. Mary, we should remind our viewers that Justice Alito wrote the court's decision on Dobbs in 2022. Right. Will he refer the matter to the full court now? I, I think so. I mean, I think this is obviously a pretty complicated um, and important case. We've already seen FDA under conflicting orders from a district court judge, Thomas Rice, from Washington and from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. This is the kind of question that the entire court needs to answer. So I imagine that's what we're going to see happen next. Mm. And as we as we wait, what do you think the Biden administration is doing? I, I think there's a lot prepare? of. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, um, I think there's there's probably some contingency planning about what FDA is going to do if the Supreme Court lets 
either the Fifth Circuit's version of this go into effect or um, if the Supreme Court even goes all the way back to what Judge Matthew Kaczmarek said, which would be even more extreme. Um, I think there's also some ongoing conversations about the federal Comstock Act, which both the Fifth Circuit and Judge Kaczmarek referenced. Um, there may sooner or later, depending on what the Supreme Court says, be a push to repeal the Comstock Act that the Biden administration mentions. There may be conversations about how the FDA uses its enforcement discretion. Um, a lot of stuff is going to be going on behind the scenes, but I think we're not going to see a lot out of the Biden administration unless or until we get something clear and relatively final from the Supreme Court. Well, of course, Mary, that uh, Kaczmarek order could affect a lot more than Mifepristone. This was uh, potentially impacting many drugs and, and their FDA approval as it went to the FDA process here. How's the court going to look at that since this could be about much more than an abortion pill? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's precedent setting, right? That if, if someone doesn't like the way the FDA interpreted the science, they can go to court and find a judge to second guess the FDA. And of course, we know in recent years in the United States that any number of drugs have been politicized, almost anything having to do with COVID-19, for example, just to take one instance of this. Yeah. And so that would be the message sent if the Supreme Court allows this to continue, that the FDA's processes are not final and that federal judges are there to second guess them. And I, I don't know if the Supreme Court wants to be doing that, especially after all, because this was a court that was very critical of Roe v. Wade for turning judges into medical review boards, as as some conservatives once put it. And that would be what would happen if this precedent um, isn't changed or if the Supreme Court doesn't do something to intervene. I also want to get your take on what's going on in Florida. Obviously, last night, very late at night, Governor DeSantis <laughs> signed into legislation what the Republicans voted for, which is a six-week abortion ban. And it will take effect, but only after we figure out what's going on with the 15-week abortion ban that's in court. How do you expect this play to play out? Well, I, I think that uh, there's not much doubt. Well, the, the, the Florida Supreme Court has been transformed by Governor DeSantis. So even though precedent in Florida protects abortion rights under the state constitution, I think everyone is expecting this court that's stacked with DeSantis nominees to reverse that conclusion and allow both laws to go into effect. Um, I think why this happened at night is because Governor DeSantis finds himself in the same position most Republicans do, which is kind of caught between their base, which expects sweeping bans on abortion. Um, that's especially true of someone who's likely running for president like Governor DeSantis and has to think of getting through the primary against Donald Trump. And on the other hand, the fact that voters, including voters in Florida, overwhelmingly reject something like six-week bans. We have polling out of Florida indicating voters don't want this. Um, we have national results of elections in 2022 and ballot initiatives and otherwise that suggest this will be bad in general elections. So I think um, you, Governor DeSantis doing this late at night is showing you that th he's finding himself in some ways between a rock and a hard place when it comes to what to do about abortion rights. Well, from a practical standpoint, Mary, we were just discussing how Florida has actually become a, a haven. It's been a magnet for people huh. seeking safe abortions from other southern states uh, that have uh, heartbeat laws or, or outright bans. Will this not only reverse that, but send them somewhere else? Where, where will people go in that region? Well, at the moment, they might go to North Carolina, which has also been a hub, but North Carolina has a ban pending, and one member of the Democratic Party there just switched their political affiliation to the GOP. So it's it, the question is really whether North Carolina can mount enough of a majority to have enough to overcome the Democratic governor's veto. So it's a possibility there that we're going to see that haven shut down as well. The only remaining one regionally really is South Carolina, where that state Supreme Court struck down its six-week ban as violating the state constitution. So that's looking like the best option at the moment. But of course, state Supreme Court decisions aren't necessarily forever because state Supreme Court judges can be um, replaced in elections. So I think South Carolina is likely to be the receiving state for the time being, but you know that's not necessarily going to last forever. And it's also worth saying that patients in the South are going to have a hard time adjusting to figure out where they're supposed to go, right? The more uncertainty there is, yeah, the right. more people are going to just not know what to do and not exercise any kind of choice at all. Well, we'd like to stay close to you on this story, Mary. Thanks for being with us today. Professor Mary Ziegler, thank you for being with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, we'll continue discussion on the abortion pill fight with our political panel. That's still ahead on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito temporarily pausing restrictions on the abortion pill that we were just talking about, and we want to play this to the panel. Our discussion now includes Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, Bloomberg politics contributors, and our closers, as we like to say, yeah. on a Friday. It's Friday. Uh, Jeannie, I'll start with you on this one. I mean, here we have a five-day reprieve. A day after Ron DeSantis signs a six-week ban into law late at night, what's going on here? The, the story just continues to move uh, despite what seems to be the preference of voters. Yeah, what seems to be the preference of voters and the reality for the Republican Party and Republican strategists who all know that moving in this direction is not good as they try to win suburban women, as they try to win young people as we move into 24. But, you know, we are seeing that the, you know, the pro-life movement is still a real force and they are out there. They have won this big, big victory with the Dobbs decision, which Alito himself authored, yes, as we right. know. And so... They are still pushing to make changes in this country and not just to limit women's access to abortion, but to get rid of abortions altogether. And it is what they would like to achieve, but it is very bad for them politically when you think about the Republican Party. So it's a conundrum that they just can't seem to get themselves out of. Well, 53 percent of Americans think that there should be abortion pills and exit polls from 2022 election showed that abortion was one of the reasons why people actually went out to vote. How do the Republicans stack up against that next year? Well, I, first of all, they're, they're going to try and change the topic. Um, there's no question that uh, the people running for office, uh, whether they're in Congress or for president, uh, don't want to spend the entire year talking about abortion. So the, the courts have thrust this on the party. Uh, the candidates didn't go out and do this. And, and the reality is, uh, without these court movements, uh, I would be surprised if the Florida legislature would have actually uh, had the amount of time that uh, women have to uh, find an abortion in Florida. So uh, it, I think you see a movement that's sort of out of the political domain crushing the politicians because this is the only topic that they're getting asked about. Well, they want yeah. to talk about inflation. They want to talk about the recession. Yeah. Uh, they want to talk about, you know, economic development. They want to talk about, uh, you know, cutting the budget. And they can't seem to get any daylight around that. And it's probably one of the reasons uh, why the speaker is headed to New York to try and force physically <laughs> a conversation about the economy that he can't seem to get, you know, anywhere else. Well, how about Ron DeSantis, though? He signs the six-week ban into law just before 11 o'clock at night. Obviously, he didn't want to have a ceremony as he held <laughs> for the 15-week ban. But, look, you've run presidential campaigns, Rick. How do you pivot from that in a general? Let's say he is the nominee. He, he's not walking away from that. Yeah, no, it's going to be very, very difficult. It's his bill now, right? Yeah. He signed it in the law. There's no sort of I was forced into it or, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, he, this is his law now, and he's going to have one of the most restrictive laws in the country in, in Florida. And yet his entire campaign is like, hey, we ought to do for the country what I've done in Florida. That's exactly. right. And he so now he's going to be blueprint. tied into this knot that he has himself created. And I think that, uh, look, he's going to keep his head down and he's going to use it to try and win the nomination. That's the reason he signed that bill. Uh, and then he's going to have to find some way of not being distracted by this in the general election. Remember, general elections are usually only about 90 days. Uh, and, and there are all kinds of things going on. Uh, so uh, I'd say it's just one of the many different hurdles that any candidate that we nominate as a Republican in this presidential context is going to have to deal with. Right. You say that he's going to use this in the primary, but he's talking about this as his blueprint to get there, mm -hmm. to get to be the candidate. Aren't Democrats just going to continuously hammer home abortion? I mean, already with this ruling coming out, there's going to be a massive march tomorrow in Washington, D.C. Won't that just continue? They'll be reminding everyone if that's his blueprint for Florida for the rest of the country, that's a six weeks abortion ban coast to coast. It, it is. And what we keep hearing from Democratic strategists is everywhere Ron DeSantis goes, from Iowa to New Hampshire, he will be asked, as will any members of Congress and Republicans who support his candidacy and endorse him, 
Do you support a six-week ban? He is not going to escape it. And I'll tell you why I think this may hurt him in the primary. His major calling card is he's electable against Biden and Trump is not. Mm -hmm. Is he really electable in a general election running on a six-week ban when most women don't know that they are even pregnant? And unlike Donald Trump, he signs it into law to Rick's point, and he wants to take that nationwide may make him less electable than he wants to be in a general election. Well, what's also interesting, of course, is the former president has been conspicuously quiet yeah, exactly. about this. By although, design, I, I imagine. Although the overturning of Roe v. Wade dates to him and his judges. Um, so, obviously... It's going to be very interesting. Keep in mind, Ron DeSantis is coming to Washington for a fundraiser in the coming days. And to Jeannie's point, those who attend will be asked questions about this, whether they want to be or not. Yeah, because they have a messaging problem. How, how, do we message on, how do we message on this when 53% of the country don't agree with you? All right, our political panel will be sticking with us this Friday. Our closers, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. You too. <laughs> Oof, what a what a welcome that was for former Vice President Mike Pence earlier today at the National Rifle Association. Our political panel is back with us. Rick, I have to start with you. The former vice president booed. He was quite funny though. I love yeah, you too. Yeah, he did, was good. he did well. It yeah. would have been bad if he got upset. It would have been kind of awkward. But the former President Trump was applauded. Sure. Doesn't this show... I mean, this is Trump's base. I mean, you know, he did more for the Second Amenders than any president uh, since Ronald Reagan. And so the, the reality is that's his group. And, and by the way, I mean, I, I think if you polled the, the NRA membership at this convention, you'd probably find that most of them would agree with Trump that, you know, these guys were patriots who attacked the Capitol, not... Yeah, insurrectionists. So, you know, just consider your audience, right? This is a self-selected group of people who come to the NRA convention to be politically active, you know, and support, you know, the candidates that they choose, and that's Donald Trump. So uh, I don't think anybody else is getting their nose under that tent. I'm guessing Donald Trump and Mike Pence were not hanging out backstage at this thing. <laughs> they were both there in person, though. All the presidential candidates and presumptive candidates are speaking either virtually or in person, Jeannie. And, of course, the timing here is important. Uh, knowing the backdrop with gun violence, and just in the last two weeks and what we've seen here, the NRA convention is, was described earlier by Bloomberg's Mark Niquette as a festive event, a circus-like atmosphere. They're raffling guns. You go downstairs to the book fair. You're like at a, a Vegas convention. Mm -hmm. All of the candidates have to show up for this right now, despite the, the conversation in America. What does that speak to uh, the hold that the NRA has on politics. It's stunning. A hundred days in, over 140 mass murders, and maybe I have the number wrong, it might have been 160 mass murders in this country. And despite that, despite Uvalde, despite Louisville, despite yep. Nashville, you still have a Republican Party and not one potential leading candidate for the presidency can stand up to these people and say, enough is enough. Gun owners in this country believe the vast majority in common sense gun reform. And yet, to Rick's point, the people at the NRA convention themselves are just not in line with the American public, and yet they go hat in hand and bow to them. And so this is where the Republican Party is, and this has got to be very frightening for anybody in the Republican Party who wants to win the White House back in 2024, because this is an issue that people care about. We saw that just with the Tennessee Three, and we will continue to see it. God forbid we have another mass murder in this country. Well, when you look at the polling on this, and we just did abortion, how that does not poll well and Republicans are not lighting up where independents are, when you look at dissatisfaction or very dissatisfied with where the policies on guns, Republicans, Republican leaning independents, 44 percent. Democrats, Democrat leaning independents, 84 percent. Independents also want 
some stricter gun laws. Well, Democratic leaning independents want res more Sorry, restrictive gun laws. Yeah. And so, you know, look, indep independents, independents are not. Win you know, elections. Independents, uh, they fall into three categories, right? Democratic leaning independents, Republican leaning independents, mm -hmm. and real independents who actually uh, don't have a clue, you know, which party they're going to vote for. And that is a smaller and smaller number. But the reality is, unlike abortion, which has a lot of movement right now in the political side of whether or not people are willing to support. Uh, the policies that either this administration or other administrations have, have put forth, guns is relatively settled, right? There is very little movement mm -hmm. over the last 20 years in people who either support or oppose gun registrations, gun uh, 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 rules and safety measures that uh, have been put up in Congress. And yeah. so there's just very little political movement on that and therefore less leverage to get anything done. All right, our thanks, our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shan Zeno, of course, political science professor at Iona University. All these stories and more on the Balance of Power newsletter. Thanks for joining us. See you this Monday.